Hi, I'm Mike, owner of the InGroove in Phoenix, Arizona. So about three weeks ago, I got a tip that there was an auction coming up here in Phoenix. This was a pretty substantial classical and jazz, audiophile jazz collection that was being made available in Sun City West, or Sun City, which is a retirement community here on the outskirts of Phoenix. They had posted some photographs to their auction house website. These, this is a typical retirement community auction house. So this isn't something that they typically get. Well, they posted like 300 photos. You know, they knew that the stuff that this gentleman had, that the estate was selling, was probably pretty good because of the equipment that the gentleman had. It was, now this wasn't something that they were selling. I guess it was willed to a family member but for whatever reason, they didn't want the records. But the equipment that the guy had was, you know, unbelievable. VTL, two amps, uh, Wilson Alexandria speakers, really high-end clear audio turntable, Goldfinger statement cartridge. You know, he had a really upper end, you know, and this is, again, I'm kind of approximating what he had because they didn't photograph the equipment, but the equipment was kind of visible in some of the photos. And there was a lot of photos. There was probably around 1,000 to 2,000 photos of all the records that were being auctioned. And I've had some experience with some of these small-time auctions. Some of these auction houses, you can go and you can get stuff for next to nothing. So, you know, I was, I was hoping. I was biding my time. There was about three weeks until the auction. Well... Word started getting out a little bit more and more. People started, more and more people started, hey, Mike, did you see that classical? Oh, what about all those great jazz records? And, you know, it's like, oh, this is unfortunate. But, you know, I've got a huge edge when it comes to classical because I'm really knowledgeable in classical where I would say most record store owners are not. It is not a very high-moving item in any record store unless you specialize in classical. So it... It was something that I had uh, high hopes for. I figured that it would be uh, really good, barring any mega classical collector catching wind and coming in from another state. Then somebody emailed me, uh, you know, like four or five days before the auction, and they sent me a link on Reddit, and I'm like, you know, you got to be kidding me. Now, it wasn't just records that the guy had. The guy had a pretty decent early CD collection. I bought all the CDs, every single CD lot in the auction, and the guy had a pretty nice reel-to-reel -reel collection. You know, a lot of you guys know I'm a big fan of reel-to-reels, and the guy had a pretty substantial two-track reel-to-reel -reel collection. The early uh, original stereo reel-to-reels were all two-track. They were done in real time. They were one-to-one -one transfers. They were pretty exceptional sounding, and this guy had a pretty decent reel-to-reel -reel collection. I got about 75% of those. But, yeah, so this, you know, I'm going to show you guys some pictures. This is a picture of the final haul from, this is what I ended up winning. It was somewhere along the 45 box range of LPs. Now, it was a little bit weird because the way the auction house had set it up was by the shelf in the gentleman's house. So here's an example of a shelf taken in the original owner's house and how it was set up. And you can kind of see some of these photos. This one is, you know, an EMI shelf. You can clearly tell because you can see all of the upper square EMI logos on the shelf. This is a shelf of kind of newer audiophile stuff, you could tell, because you could see all the white spines. So the way they did the auction was they took shelf four, and maybe it was in five or six boxes, and you bid for the right to get the box first box of your choice. So, you know, like any collection, maybe that one particular shelf had a really solid record in it. Uh, I'll give you, for instance, I got the John Starker 
box right over my shoulder. That was in a box with a bunch of crummy box sets that were all dollar bin fodder. I ended up getting that particular lot for $300. The buyer premium was pretty cheap at this auction. It was 10%. But yeah, so you essentially had the option of buying one box for that price or however many boxes you wanted. But typically they got progressively cheaper. There was a couple of boxes that I won, like the EMI lot. I think I got these EMI boxes. They were like 150 and there was about 50 to 65 records in every box. But these EMI lots boxes went for under, you know, under a couple hundred dollars. And, you know, there was like three boxes for the shelf. So I just said, you know, I'll take them all. But it turns out a couple of guys did show up from out of town. There's some folks there from California. There was some folks from a gentleman who owns a record store in Florida, or excuse me, in Georgia showed up. But there were some people that knew what they were doing. But... You know, this is Phoenix, and if you're going to come to Phoenix and you're going to bid on auctions, I'm going to punish you a little bit. So uh, nobody left Phoenix with any cheap records that day. It was, a, it was an expensive auction for everybody. Like I said in the title of the video, I myself spent $25,113, but I won a bulk of the quality stuff in this auction. There was a few things that I didn't win. There was a pretty significant amount of single-sided classical, classic, classical 45 RPMs. There was a 1S box that I got pieces of. And that and I'll kind of show you that as I kind of peruse through this collection. So the auction house, whatever was on the shelf, they auctioned up. Well, this particular owner had a lot of single-sided 45 RPM classical records titles and they, a lot of them were broken up into other boxes. There was a Miles Davis kind of blue. It was spread in two different boxes. So, you know, you had to make sure you won both boxes. But yeah, so, you know, I'm going to kind of show you guys some of the collection. I'll try to remember some of the stories from the auction house and we'll kind of take a look at what I was able to get and, you know, maybe leave me in the comments and tell me what you think. Like I said, uh, you know, like I said, I wasn't going to let anybody take any of that stuff out of their cheap. You know, it was, uh, I was very, very aggressively bidding, you know, and you can kind of tell because towards the end people were, you know, people were coming back to me kind of talking smack. Well, you know, that guy over there said you overpaid for everything. You overpaid. Well, some stuff I paid full-blown retail, but I got to tell you, this is probably one of the absolute best classical collections for American classical stuff. So that would be like the London Bluebacks. Uh, Mercury Living Presence and the RCA Living Stereo. I don't think there could be a better collection, you know, maybe as good, but probably not a better collection of this in the world. So it was for me, you know, I had a lot of great titles in my collection. For me, a lot of this stuff I'm keeping. So don't email me right away. If this stuff makes its way onto the website, a lot of the stuff I have, it'll be for sale. But it's going to take me a significant amount of time to process because the guy was actually he was a he was an audiophile and this is an audiophile collection from a jazz lover. It was TAS Absolute Sound list all the way. Everything on the, in this collection for the most part that was on the TAS list is in this collection, uh, hands down. But yeah, I uh, for me I didn't care if I had to pay through the nose. I was going to do it because for me, this literally got me one of the absolute best classical record collections in the entire world for American stuff. I mean, there's a lot of UK imports, a lot of DECA, HMV, Columbia stuff in this collection. I'll show you. But, you know, there's no four, five Columbia Kogans in this collection. I mean, there's a lot of key European stuff that's missing. But as far as the American stuff goes, this is absolutely a pretty <laughs> astonishingly good collection. So I kind of broke it down into, there is a pile of stuff I'm not going to show you. I kind of took out some of the cream of the crop and I'm going to show you. So we've got a lot of audiophile jazz, audiophile classical stuff, uh, EMI. Over here we've got London Bluebacks. There was a classic records Royal Ballet box. This is uh, UK Decca stuff, uh, Royal Ballet 1S box set. Mercury Living Presence, uh, 
John L. Starker box. Uh, three solid rows of beautiful living stereo stuff. Couple of nice stacks of Mercury Living Present stuff. More audiophile. A lot of classic records uh, stuff in this collection. More UK stuff. That's going to be like a Columbia pile, HMV pile. Uh, Lyrida, pile of reference recording, Wilson, ORG. And then over here, I've got some Mobile Fidelity stuff. There was a lot of super analog discs, stuff of that uh, nature. And there's also... 30 more boxes of stuff again. I'm not going to show you. But let's take a look at this collection. And like I said, uh, there were so many good factors, there were so many factors into this collection that made me bid as ferociously as I did. One, a lot of this stuff was in this guy's personal collection for 40 years because he cleaned stuff and he would date it on the inner sleeve. He would use like a early MoFi sleeve or a nice inner sleeve, and he put the date. I'm assuming it was either the date he acquired it or the date he cleaned it. But you had a lot of dates going back to the 80s. And the guy's equipment was second to none. So you know this stuff wasn't of use. This stuff was being played on absolute top-notch gear. Also, I kind of knew of the gentleman. So there was a chain of classical record stores in Tucson called, called Jeff's Classical Records. I actually bought the tail end of what Jeff had left. Uh, a couple of years back. He lived in Phoenix until recently. He moved out of town. Uh, but we had talked pretty extensively about his days owning classical. And he came in multiple times. And he always had said to me, you know, Dr. Bob ever show up? Dr. Bob ever show up? And he kind of described this guy to a T. And then lo and behold, this collection pops up. And I'd be about 99% sure this was this particular guy he was talking about. But, you know, a guy who was building off the... TAS list, like, you know, all the living stereo stuff or 1S stampers. I mean, it's it's an amazing collection through and through. But let's take a look. I'm going to kind of start uh, with probably the most desirable stuff in the collection, which unfortunately in, in 2020 is not the classical, although there's some amazing classical music in here. But let's take a look at some of the jazz and the audiophile records. So here we're going to start with... These are single-sided classic records releases. So, Casino Royale, side soundtrack, single-sided. Heifetz, single-sided, more single-sided. So these I kind of sorted out and I bunched up as sets. More Heifetz. And there was a lot of these. There was maybe two or three, you know, shelves of this stuff. I did not win most of the single-sided 45 RPM stuff because it, it, it went for good money. And it's just all the great reissues that Analog Productions has put out. It's really kind of collapsed the prices of these. So they've definitely taken, taken a hit. But yeah, these are all classic uh, 45 RPM single sided. So this is the 70s reissue of The Sound of Jazz. Great audio file record in print from Analog Productions. Uh, a couple MoFi's. There was a classical MoFi box, but man, those went for like 40 to 50 bucks a record. And I've got them all. And the best mobile fidelity title they had was actually the sealed Someday My Prince Will Come. And I ended up winning this. This particular box had some good stuff in it. It had a DCC neck and coal. It had this. I think I won that for 50 bucks. That was just an unbelievable bar bargain. I don't know what happened there. So some kind of oddball reissues. Decent amount of o uh, OJCs. This is a UK repressing of Kind of Blue. Original. Uh, Chesky stuff. So what is this? This would be, I'm guessing that's Speaker's Corner. A lot of Speaker's Corner stuff in here. OJCs. That's an OJC. A couple of, very little in the way of original jazz in this collection. Record that has been on my want list for absolute minimum five years, but probably longer. 
Miles Davis, Live Around the World. This only came out in Germany. Fantastic record. This is a double. He does a cover of Michael Jackson's Human Nature on this. And uh, Cindy Lauper's Time After Time. This is a fantastic record. Still sealed. Really a fan of that. Glad to finally have it. Be cracking that open. Sketches of Spain. I think that's a 2i. There's a really minty 2i kind of blue. Now this, like I was telling you earlier, earlier, this particular collection, all of the 45 RPMs were scattered out, the classics. This is all classic 45 RPMs that aren't complete. I do not have the matches for them. So I gave the couple of guys my phone number and told them flat out, I'm like, the first guy told like, look, you don't have complete sets. You bought partial shelves. I bought partial shelves. The other guy bought partial shelves. And also they took the road case that was separate, that the Led Zeppelin box that came in and also that one Xbox S box came in. And they auctioned that off for $75 I won that for. I'm like, well, yeah, I'll take that for $75. Somebody's going to need to spare one of those for their Led Zeppelin box or their one S box. But yeah, so hopefully I can get with some of these guys and try to complete some of these classic record sets. So let's move on to the next much more exciting row of records. Now this whole shelf of jazz records, I won them all. And I wanna say, let's pull out the sheet here. Now these were all on shelf 22 and I'll kind of show you some photos of how it was laid out. But shelf 22 went for the receipt. One, two, three, four, five, six boxes. And box one was like 1,050, 800, 600, 650, 525, 525. So it was like around $4,000 with buyer's premium. But this is what $4,000 with buyer's premium gets you. Now keep in mind some of that classic record stuff over there was in there, that Miles was in there. But yeah, sealed, Chet Baker, Analog Productions, Acoustic Tech, double 45 RPM, goes for... God, these have gotten ex astronomically expensive. Two to four hundred dollars last I looked. Coleman Hawkins, Nighthawk, another record that's pushing upward of four hundred dollars. Sonny Rollins, Saxophone Colossus. This was open. Still sealed copy of Tenor Madness. Still, uh, no, that's open. Way out west. Actually, my favorite Sonny Rollins record. Let's see, Vince Guaraldi Trio, Count Basie meets Oscar Peterson, that was sealed, this is open, sealed Cannonball Adderley, open Cannonball Adderley, Bill Evans, Waltz for Debbie, same series, double disc, 45 RPM Acoustic Tech, that was open, let's see, open, Sunday at the Village Vanguard, sealed copy of Moonbeams, open copy of Duke's Big Four. Now, a lot of these I have, but a good chunk of these are actually going to end up staying in my collection. Willie Dixon, Willie's Blues, I've got that. Let's see, Boss Tenor, Great West Montgomery record, Full House, 45 RPM, Monk. Again, all these are the Acoustic Tech doubles. Monk and Coltrane, Ben Webster, John Coltrane, Soul Train, Art Pepper meets Rhythm Section. This is a unique, uh, a unique record in the stereo presentation on that. It's quite interesting. Let's see, Miles Davis, this is still sealed cooking. Bags Groove, that's open. Lightning Hopkins, Ray Charles, Corgi and Bess. Let's see. An original Keystone 3. This has been reissued by Pure Pleasure, if I'm not mistaken. So now this is some single disc classic 45 RPM stuff, yeah. It's Billy Holiday. Good vibes at the pawn shop. Now this is some of the jazz related classic 45 RPMs, single sided. Sonny Rollins, this was the Miles Davis that I told you was in two separate boxes, 45 RPM single classic records. 
Sonny Stitt, Duke Ellington, the single-sided Billy Holiday. Let's try to get it. Lady in Satin, Billy Holiday. You know, Analog Productions bought Louis Armstrong, bought Classic Records. So you'll notice a lot of these are actually in print or were in print as Analog Productions titles. And that really killed the price of a lot of these. Sketches of Spain, single disc, 45 RPM. Mingus a Hum, classic 45 RPM. Brubeck, timeout, classic 45 RPM. The Analog Productions uses the exact same metalwork as that record, and it is one of my absolute favorite records. Sell a ton of them on the website. Tina Brooks. Bang, Baroom, and Harp, absolutely fantastic audio file record, must own, it is in print as an analog productions, 33 RPM. Fun record, very fun record. Single disc, Ellington, classic records, classic record stuff, that's a sealed Cannonball Adderley, sealed Ella Fitzgerald, let's see, sealed, or no, that's op open Ellington. This is the Classic Records 45 RPM kind of blue. Duke Ellington. Louis Armstrong. This is the Let's see. This is uh, I'll have to check that out. Look at that. Just like the Steely Dan Asia. Like classic record stuff, DCC, famous blue raincoat. There's a lot of Opus 3 stuff in this collection. Early analog productions. Fantastic album, Jazz at the Pawn Shop. Oh, that's one of those analog productions. What do we got? OJC Miles. This looks like some Speaker's Corner stuff. Speaker's Corner. Some more DCC. Yeah. This, this is a pretty solid musically, uh, pretty solid collection music, musically. This EMI stuff, really high quality, well recorded. Not a lot of heavy hitters in this. I'm just gonna kinda quickly skim. A lot of these were bought directly out of the United Kingdom. You could see shops, you know, and I didn't kinda organize these yet. Some of this stuff you're seeing coming up, I've kinda spent some time and organized. So the era of stuff, you know, you'll see again, a lot of these Jeff's classical records. It's kind of funny. I remember Jeff saying to me at the time when the TAS list came out, he said it turned classical upside down. And the old school classical guys just were infuriated by it because, you know, there was a lot of great sounding or classical that wasn't being paid attention to that was essentially becoming worth nothing. And then these titles that a lot of these old school classical guys felt weren't musically that good, the performance wasn't that good or whatever, but had good sonics were becoming worth huge amounts of money. But if you go through this collection, that's a testament reissue. If you go through this collection, there's a few of these, like the Kogans were testament reissues. If you go through this collection, you'll kind of see that, you know, these are really good. You'll kind of see that uh, Jeff made some money off of that TAS list because a lot of these records were worth more back then than they are now. But this is a really, you know, in the United States, this is a very impressive, impressive EMI collection. But yeah, so let's get on to some of the more impressive stuff, to me anyways.
These are the London Bluebacks that were in the collection. There was a lot more London titles, but I kind of showed, I'm showing you just the Bluebacks. So if you're not a classical fan, it's actually quite interesting. So this is an original Decca of the Firebird. And this is a London copy of the Firebird. The Decca record is worth five to ten times the amount of money maybe, you know, significant amount of money more than this. What's interesting is both records were pressed in the UK at the same exact factory at the same exact time using the same exact metalwork. Everything is identical about them except for the outer cover and the label. But there are people online that will tell you that they sound differently, that the DECA is better, and they are crazy. Those people are hallucinating. One of the absolute biggest misconceptions in classical vinyl to this day. These records sonically are absolutely positively the same. There is no difference. I don't care what anybody says. You can never, ever, ever, in my opinion, tell the difference of these two records in any form of blind study. You couldn't do it. Unless, you know, one was obviously an inferior collect condition. But, you know... Three-cornered hat. I've got an original Decca of this record. Goes well over a thousand dollars. The London, still a couple hundred dollar record. Still a very desirable record, but not worth nearly the same amount of money. And you can kind of see, you know, the dead wax information. All that is exactly the same on these records. The only difference is they have the London label. So, more than likely, had a machine pounding these suckers out. One machine on the left had London labels in it. The other machine on the right had DECA labels in it. Now, some of the artwork, don't get me wrong, on the DECA stuff is actually... Now, this is not a good example because this is actually really a cool piece of artwork. But some of the artwork on the DECA stuff was significantly cooler, but it used cheap... You know, they use that crappy, thin, laminate, laminated cover, where in the U.S. you got this really thick, hefty piece of cardboard. Now, it's kind of ironic because in the U.K. everybody wanted U.S. pressings because of this. And here we all want what we can't have, so everybody wants this. But DECA, probably the absolute, you know, this era of DECA is probably the absolute best sounding vintage classical you will ever buy. And... Yeah, it is significantly more affordable than their UK counterparts. But yeah, we've got the Firebird, another solid title. I mean, just this collection had all the key stuff. Look at that, it's fantastic. So a lot of these titles I had, well, not a lot of them. I had some of the key titles. I didn't have that, didn't have that, didn't have that. Didn't have that, I had a copy of that, you know, so there's, I've got the UK version of that, which is actually quite expensive, but this kind of really, boom, instant collection. Jeff's Classical Records, a condition, $25. It's kind of funny, some of these records you'll see $25, $30 on them, and you go online, you couldn't get $5 for them. Some of them you find them $12, $13 on them, and they go for obnoxious amounts of money. But yeah, all beautiful. These are all first pressing London bluebacks. I kind of weeded and called out quickly all the lesser stuff. Now, oddly enough, he had a lot of doubles in this collection, but he did not, you know, for like the living stereo stuff and the Mercury Living Presence, but he did not have a lot of doubles of these. Now, he had a significant deck of collection, and the way they were sitting on the shelf was, you know, the decos were mixed in with these. There's some dead weight in here, but I'm gonna go through it. 
listen to it, decide what I want to keep. He had a lot of really good notes on this collection as well, you know, because he was buying a lot of this stuff from places that kind of specialized in audiophile clientele. You know, so a lot of these records have notes on pieces of paper. You know, the beginning has three ticks. ORG does a copy of this. It's pretty good. You know, so there's some good helpful notes. We're doing this in my living room because I, uh, this is the only free space that I had enough space to even do this. So there's a lot more that I wanted to show you guys in this collection, but I got to get this stuff out of my living room. My wife is going to kill me. Okay, let's take a look at some of the DECA stuff. Oh, don't forget the classic records, 45 RPM Royal Ballet box set. That was significantly more desirable before Analog Productions reissued it. The only difference is that single-sided, the new Analog Productions box set is not. All right, so the DECA stuff I've kind of arranged by, uh, you know, I put all the 2000 series stuff in the front, and I've kind of completely organized it by number. So a lot of the really key stuff, now this is where the collection is weak. He probably just didn't have access to it. If this guy lived another 20 years and or was like 20 years younger and putting this collection together, I'd imagine this would have been complete. With the advent of the internet, you know, he would have had all the, co he would add all the key 2000 series deck of stuff, all the Columbia. I mean, there's still good titles in here. You know, he was buying them, but That's still a decent amount of 2000 series stuff. Audiophile favorite. Of course, he had multiple copies, different pressings, first pressings, later pressing. That's a reissue. He had the speaker's corner version, I think, and maybe Testament did it as well. Now we're getting into the 6000 series stuff. Some of these 6,000 titles are good. Some of them, you know, they don't carry the, you know, musically fantastic, but some of these don't carry the same value as, actually most of these don't carry the same value as the early, more desirable 2000 series SXL stuff. Again, we're gonna skim through some of the stuff because let's see what this says. Beginning is mint minus rest is VG plus plus or worse. Wideband, no charge. Got it for free, a little throw in. But like I said, I'll skim through this stuff because the really impressive stuff within this collection, in my opinion, was the US stuff. Jano Starker box, like I said, beautiful near mint shape. Got that for 300 bucks. The lid is separated, but I've got a little lesser vinyl copy of it with like a minty box. So I'm gonna actually be able to have a nice near mint copy of that now. Good, real good. Holst, Speaker's Corner redid it. The original list, not very expensive. Really good record. But yeah, now let's take a look at some of the Living Stereo stuff. I've got a lot of really solid key Living Stereo titles, but I was missing a few things. I was missing the Royal Ballet box, beautiful 1S box, vinyls, uh, VG plus, the box has got some wear to it, but still, you know, in that condition, it's still probably at least a thousand dollar record. Really near mint copies of that go for four or five thousand dollars, just astronomical money. And I mean, stuff like this, I didn't have this. A beautiful, also Sprock, beautiful copy, 1S. I mean, absolutely fantastic. 
super excited to have this in my collection. Just really a, what looks to be an unplayed record. Offenbach. This came from Smarts Records, Instruments, and Music, Mansfield, Ohio. This is some of the nice early stuff. A lot of these he has multiple copies of. Bartok. You know, he, uh, you know, he would upgrade copies. Or, so my buddy over there, Jeff, told me that this guy would just, any, you know, he had a standing list of certain titles that he wanted and anyone that came in the store, he bought. Really good record. And, you know, look at this, $80 back in, this would have been probably the 80s. You know, Jeff closed up in the 90s, so, you know, this was $80 marked down to 50 As new. Oh, so, you know, there was, uh, at the end, there was 10 boxes. We got two copies of the C. There was 10 boxes, mystery boxes. They didn't photograph them. They... You got a couple of minutes, this is at the very end of the auction. He's like, oh, by the way, uh, we got these boxes. We didn't have time to f photograph them, look through them real quick. And, you know, let's, uh, we're going to bid on them. I ended up winning all 10 boxes because I'm a degenerate gambler because we nobody really looked through any of the boxes. But I saw a lot of EMIs, some DECA stuff. I saw some living stereos, and there was a box that was like mostly classical records, or excuse me, classic records stuff. You know, the audio file label. So, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm down for that. Fantastic record, two copies. But uh, some great stuff that was in there. The only thing it was, and I knew that there was something wrong with this auction because you've been going through all the photographs and it's like all the key, you know, audio file stuff is there. The TAS list, everything is there. But there was no, uh, no Pines of Rome. Missing. But in one of those boxes was two 1S stamper Pines of Rome. Unbelievable, that Firebird was in one of those boxes. So, uh, yeah, I kind of pulled a, uh, I kind of multiple copies. That's a common living stereo title. Kind of pulled a rabbit being able to Hit that last few boxes. Cover mint, looks mint, plays mint. 15 bucks. Let's try to maybe move that camera a little bit for you guys. See where we're at. Let's see. Great, great collection. Again, like I said, the living stereo stuff, the Mercury Living Presence was one of the most impressive aspects of this guy's collection. Let's take a look at. Going to have to kind of skim through these guys. We're getting into a tight corner here. Witch's Brew, another want. But never pulled the trigger on it. Now I got a beautiful copy right there. Rare LP, a lump on beginning. It's got a piece of paper in it. Cleaned. Mint worth two to three hundred. Some ticks, pops, mint minus, $85. Yeah, it actually is a mint minus record. I checked it out, but uh, yeah. 
I'm about now worth two to three hundred dollars. Multiple copies of the Nutcracker. Really good record. One's got a nice seam split. Another copy looks to be in much better shape. I'm guessing, so a lot of these that had issues, cover-wise, he didn't buy stuff that wasn't really clean. Look at that, two copies. Fantastic record, really rare, really rare living stereo. It seemed like the better the title was, the more copies he had. Really good record, multiple copies. Really, really hard to find living stereo, really good record. Some later press stuff that was kind of mixed in there. Look at that, two pines of Rome. And I was shocked, I saw the first one, I'm like, okay, one of these is gonna be a 1S, right? You know, maybe he got a, a later 5S and then found a 1S and added it to his collection. Nope, he had two 1Ss. I love these sheets here from 1989. All the notes, it was clean, the whole nine yards, Shaharzard, multiple copies, four copies. Really solid record. This is another 1S. There was a note on this. And I think somebody turned it backwards at the, at the auction, yeah. Rare Cleaned Mint, 1S, $250. Mint minus, 1S. Nice early first pressing. And we're getting into the lesser titles. I'll kind of show you. I'm gonna skim through this real quick. A couple of keys in this later, living stereo stuff. But this is when you started to get into, you know, that's one of the best of the later living stereo titles, you know, value-wise. But then you start getting into some of the, you know, crummier stuff. Not that, but, you know, uh, some of the, the Dyna Groove. Actually, there's a lot of great music in this series, but as a whole... When you start to get into that Dynagru stuff, you're starting to get into the stuff that nobody wants, doesn't really hold any value. But yeah, let's move on. Let's check out some of the Mercury Living Present stuff. Hi Fiala Espanol, this is my absolute top classical record want. I bought a collection that had two really bad damaged UK versions of these in, in there. This is an absolute amazing sounding record and fun. It is a really fun record. I play this in the store all the time. A lot of people think it sounds like Christmas music, but absolutely fantastic record in the collection. Two copies of the Firebird. I mean, this is just $175. Yeah, he spent some chunk of money on the uh, living stereo stuff. Channel Starker. Ok. 
kind of skim you guys through this. Probably the most common living stereo, excuse me, Mercury Living Presence title. Just many, many dupes. All the uh, magnetic film recording, really good record. Have that in my collection already. Analog Productions did a reissue of it. Actually got a gold label promo with this last week. Pretty much all the starker stuff. <laughs> Three copies of that one was in this collection. One of the absolute rarest living stereos, and it actually says it on the cover, but uh, yeah. One of the rarest, best sounding, and most expensive Mercuries. So, you know, this note is probably from, who knows, the 80s? This is one of those titles that's held true. It was obviously expensive then, and it's still quite expensive. God, I look at some of what he paid on some of these. It's got multiple copies. I thought I saw price tags of like $50, $60. That's not that anymore. Nice box set. Marie Callis box set. Yes. Look at this. $275. Holy cow. You could probably buy 10 of them for $275. $300. <laughs> Not anymore. Good record. Funny how you look at some of the God, the classical record dealers, man. They went all out back in the day with stickering up the covers. It's like a big, big no-no now. You don't see that too much. You see it a little bit, but you would never see a store that kind of specializes in high-end stuff putting all kinds of unremovable stickers all over the place. Free copy. Fiesta and Hi-Fi, two copies. stack those there. Respighi, Pines of Rome. Not my favorite piece of music, Respighi in general. Not a huge Respighi fan, but that living stereo Pines of Rome is a uh, audiophile warhorse. It really does sound good. All right, so that is the original Living Credit, well, most of it. Again, I picked out a lot of the lesser stuff. Uh, you know, the later pressing stuff out of here. But yeah, let's take a look at some of the audio file reissues. This is a lot of classic records uh, reissues 
from the 90s. A lot of this stuff was kind of mixed in with its matching counterpart, living stereo stuff, mercury stuff. Probably had most of everything that was available. So that looks like, yeah, probably one of the last records he bought was, you know, he's got the classic records. He looks like he has a couple of, he had a couple of analog productions titles. So it must have been probably the most recent thing that was in this collection. That's multiple copies. Yeah, he definitely had some <laughs> duplication. Speaker's Corner stuff. This is Speaker's Corner mixed in with some of the classic records titles. So that is some of the audio file stuff. Let's take a look at some of the UK stuff. Again, TAS list stuff, some UK Mercury. So this is going to be some HMV Columbia stuff. You know, some good titles in here, but no real, real heavy hitters. Like I said, this was probably the weakest area of his collection. You know, a lot of $100 records, but not a lot of, you know, this is an area of record collecting that most people don't realize. That's where all the money is at. This early golden age stereo classical stuff. There are multiple five thousand dollar, three, four, five thousand dollar records. You know, kind of rivals even kind of that classic era of jazz, the Blue Note Prestige, as far as high concentration really high dollar classical records you know within the series of these uh, these labels all right let's take a look we've got now some more not necessarily audio file titles but these are kind of titles that the audio files I've kind of latched onto three copies. Really desirable audiophile record. Multiple lyric to titles. Going to skim through this. Holy cow! Four. God, he must have just crazy. Now we're getting into reference recording stuff. He had a pretty substantial amount of this. Some of that stuff, this was mixed in a lot of other places throughout the collection. So a lot of these I ended up missing out on, but I made sure to get the better titles in the boxes that had them, you know? Some of these have been redone by Analog Productions. 
that Arnold Overtures has been redone. Probably the most desirable title in the series. All right. Now we've got a good chunk of Wilson Audiophile stuff. A lot of these are actually really good sounding records. Pictures at an exhibition, really good. Another fantastic title. Sonatas for violin and piano. Another really good title. But yeah, a little chunk of Wilson Audiophile stuff. And what do we got here? It looks to be some more, this is an Alto. Guess in that speaker's corner, Nimbus Supercut stuff from the 80s. Another really desirable Chandos title. This was still sealed and warped. Got a record flattener at the store, we'll get that back to normal. Some early analog production stuff. Now somewhere in here, there is actually a test pressing. There's test pressings of the first five analog productions records, which is actually, I think, pretty, pretty cool. Because they have kind of come, become an iconic label in the last 20 years. But yeah, again, Actually, this is a QRP title. I'm pretty sure that other one wasn't. So that was probably one of the last records he ever bought. Speaker's Corner stuff, more Speaker's Corner. Classic records. There is a test pressing. Pulsed. So we had a test pressing, you had the original, original that was in there. This is going to be all the speaker's corner. Speaker's corner actually, and so these are some ORG titles, yeah, kind of run of some ORG stuff. Speaker's Corner actually does quite a lot of classical stuff. Their classical stuff, when it goes out of print, though, doesn't ever tend to go for very much money, as opposed to some of the jazz and rock titles that they've done that have become astronomically expensive. All right, this is the last of what I'm going to be showing you. These couple of piles here. Some super analog discs. Good sizable chunk of these. Some London Final LP Series titles. Gonna have to get some of these uh, resleeved. All right, guys, almost done. Some high Q supercuts, early analog productions. That was the first thing they ever did. All right, here's some of the test pressings. There's a test pressing for the Title One, Five, Five, Title Three. Test pressing for their second title. Chunk of Sheffield's Lab. Wagner, some Testament reissues, some Chesky stuff, and like I said, guys, there's a lot of other really cool stuff in this collection, but uh, yeah, so that'll do it for the showing here. All right, guys, tell me what you think in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time.